So I'm going to substitute for <coughs> Gustavo Carrillo. Uh, he had no visa problems or anything, but he wasn't able to attend. So uh, this is uh, a discussion of virtual flights of hydroscopic sodium hurricanes. And the mot motivation from this came from earlier work by Henny and Zhang. So she wasn't my student. <laughs> She was a, a, a student of Greg McFarquhar at the University of Illinois, got her PhD there. I actually served on her committee. And the background was she came to me and she wanted to do simulations of the effect of African dust uh, on tropical cyclones. And she decided that uh, she couldn't do this with work, but physics in it wasn't adequate for that. And when she came to work, came and asked to work with, with us, with our model, and so I gave her the code that Mike Montgomery uh, uh, group had set up that included a balanced vortex initialization. And she went back and she did her research on it, and I served on the committee. Um, so that's kind of the background on that, and that's the, that's the, the model version that Mike used, by, for example, to look at bottom-up genesis of tropical cyclones. <clears throat> First of all, kind of alluded to this hypothesis over and over again. It's kind of a combination of what Danny uh, Rosenfeld and, and I put together independently. And the hypothesis is that in the outer rain bands, increasing concentrations of CCM results in reduced collision coalescence, which results in increased supercool water amounts aloft. The freezing from the supercool water leads to enhanced uh, latent heat of freezing and ultimately enhanced precipitation and low-level cooling and evaporation. The in increase in low-level cold flow coverage in the outer rain band regions blocks the flow of energy into the storm core, inhibiting the intensification of the tropical cyclone. However, the amount of suppression of the strength of the, of the tropical cyclone depends on the timing between the transport of CCN to the outer rain bands and the intensity and life cycle of the, of the outer rain band convection. The outer rain band convection needs to be strong, or at least uh, intense enough, to, to transport the super cool water aloft, and that isn't always the case. I mentioned about Henian simulations. One of the things that confused me and I and was tried to understand for a number a long time was why didn't she see a monotonic response to increasing CCM? Why didn't she saw Joe showed you a slide with a fairly significant uh, reduction in the intensity of the storm. That was her first set of simulations. Later on, she put simulations in with CCN at 500 per cc and 1,000, 750, 1,500, 3,000, and so forth, and she didn't get a monotonic response. Sometimes it actually increased or didn't change much, and then, but overall, it was a general in, uh, tendency as an CCN increase, the storm intensity decreased. But I said it had this wobble in it that we couldn't understand. So we took the code apart and and uh, went through it and made sure there weren't any bugs in it and everything. And then we went through and added the upgrades in the microphysics and that, and, uh, and then repeated the simulation. One of the things that was the result of those simulations was that virtually none of the dust actually entered, entered within about 45 kilometers of the central region of the storm. It was all washed out. So we have aerosol all in the surrounding region, and very little that ever made it into the interior. So any, any of the action that took place in response to aerosol had to be in the outer regions. And moreover, it had to, the aerosol, to have the impact according to the hypothesis, it had to be, have its worked its way into the region, the outer rain dance, where the, where the convection was intense. And it didn't always do, do it work that, work that way. So we decided that we let's try to seed the storm with, um, um, with targeted seeding and just do introduce the, the, the material just as if we're flying a C-130 or maybe a fleet of C-130s in the outer rain bands and see if we can get a response. Uh, the microphysics in this model, by the way, is a much maligned belt microphysics. However, it's very different than the conventional belt microphysics because everything is done as if it's in dim space. Nucleation is done with lookup tables that include the aerosol chemistry in that. Uh, the collection is done using the collection tables based on the University of Tel Aviv uh, multi-moment dim microphysics model. Sedimentation is done as if it's a dim model. Ice excavation is done as if it's a thin model. 
Rhyming of ice particles has been, it's a, it's a thin model. So effectively, it's a thin model, except it's constrained to the assigned basis functions, and that of which we predict at least two moments, and one of my students is actually doing simulations with three moments even. So <clears throat> we basically set up the model with the finest grid spacing, with these three interactive uh, grids and one and a half kilometer grid spacing. Uh, and then we flew this airplane, a loaded with aerosol, flying at 150 meters per second, uh, presuming that we can fly this at cloud base. This may not be feasible in reality. And uh, here's just an illustration. The yellow looks at the, shows you the seated plume that's coming out of the plane. And uh, so then we're going to try to look at the response where we've targeted material right into the area that we think we need to seed or where the enhanced aerosol is going to have its major response. And if I can get it to go on hand, what did I have to do to do that? Uh, move it out of the box. Thank you. There we are. So what about super cool water? These, this is just showing the, on the right, just the panel where the, where the seeding flight took place. And then we can look at the differences after three hours after seeding at the super cool water amounts. And you can see there's appreciable, as Alex has already pointed out a minute ago, there's appreciable increase in super cool water amounts as the collision coalescence is suppressed and more, more super cool water is transported aloft. Um, we can look at the accumulated precipitation and in response, in accordance to the hypothesis, reduce the increased uh, rainfall rates in the outer rain band, increased precipitation. Um, we look at the downdrafts in that. And uh, we see that uh, the uh, seeded flights actually produced uh, larger areas of coverage of downdrafts and that. But we did see there was a peak, a maximum, at about 8,000 per cubic centimeter. And uh, that uh, where the cold pools were not actually enhanced, in fact, they were weakened. And what we find is after we get above a certain level of concentration of CCN, the warm rain process is suppressed so much that greater amounts of ice particles, uh, first the ice crystals, small droplet particles, and so forth, are transported aloft into the anvil clouds, and the precipitation efficiency is actually reduced in that region. And as a result, there's less evaporation, the cold pools are not as cold, and the storm actually isn't weakened as much. If you look at surface winds, uh, you can see that for the different amounts, uh, where's my, here we are, going from a uh, a, a node change in CCM to 1,000, or 10,000 per CC. Here's a flip over point at around 8,000. And this is a PDF, so basically uh, cat different categories of wind intensity in the simulated storm. And generally, if we just take a look at CAT2, for example, you can see a general decrease in wind intensity. Again, until, uh, well, this one doesn't show that much. This one does show. Uh, a, a somewhat greater intensity. Uh, here's another one just showing the reduction in intensity until we get about here and then a, a slight increase in intensity in that. So it's in see, generally seen uh, a de decrease in intensity of storms up to CCN concentrations of about 8,000 per cubic centimeter. So compared to earlier simulations, the results show a monotonic response up to uh, 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 an increase in CCN up to about 8,000 per cc. Uh, this includes the response that we anticipated, uh, greater super cool liquid water amounts, stronger updrafts, the outer rain band regions. As a result, the hurricane intensity is consistently weakened with enhanced CCN up to the point of about 8,000 per cc. And, and that basically we see this took over point at about 8,000. We've seen this in our simulations of the, uh, uh, in the Houston area where the pollution came from Houston. Actually, we've seen that up to a certain point, that's roughly close to about 8,000 per cc. Again, this took over there were more and more water is thrust off and up in the anvils and decreased in intensity. So, in terms of the modulation of a conductive storm, it's all about cold pools. This is the message I want to bring back, bring to you in that. This is where the response is occurring. We see the intensity of changes and more heating and so forth, but the real modulator there is the cold pools. And, uh, and the idea that 
cold pools that are important in tropical cyclone intensity are consistent with observations that PC genesis occurs and then as rapid intensification occurs following the formation of a nearly saturated core. What does that do? That weakens cold pools. And this is consistent. The other thing is it's consistent with a vertical wind shear being a really strong impact on tropical cyclone intensity. What does that do? If you have strong vertical shear, you have greater intensity of, uh, of entrainment of dry environmental air in it, a lot of like, much greater evaporation, stronger cold pools. And so I said the line, the bottom line here is cold pools are bad for tropical cyclone intensification, strong cold pools. Uh, one of the, the mechanisms that can do that is that, first of all, during the, especially during the development stage, strong cold pools can lead to vertical decoupling between a middle-level mesoscale conductive vortex and low-level vortices. We, was, we see this in tornadic simulations and that vertical decoupling occurring between the, me, the, the uh, rotating mesocyclone and surface-based vortices and that greater cold pool intensity weakens uh, uh, tornado genesis. Same thing we see here in tropical cyclones. In the Ventura storms, the reduced cold pools can lead to blocking a moist low-level flow into the storm interior or and or, and or causing a decoupling if the cold pools are strong enough uh, between the surface space vortex and the cyclone aloft. So does this mean that we should seed hurricanes with small hydroscopic aerosol? Uh, in my opinion, the parameter space we looked at is way too small. We're only just, just grazing on the surface here. What is the response of aerosols in very intense hurricanes with nearly saturated cores and, per, and perhaps really saturated outer rain band regions. In sense, there's really saturated cores and really saturated outer rain band regions insulate the storms from the aerosol modulation, the cold pools. And so I'm not very optimistic that really intense hurricanes are going to be, say, amenable to any kind of modification by aerosols, either on purpose or inadvertent. And then the other thing, conceding to not keep up with the natural aerosol processing mechanisms. We have to introduce sea spray generation. This is a simple formula by O'Dowd. In order to have anything left for the aerosol, because the storm was just cleansing the heck out of it in that. And bringing in the aerosol from the environment, the, if the storm was really intense, it's scrubbing the heck out of the aerosol. And it's, and it's really hard to see an aerosol signal in that. And we speculate that Basic, uh, based on that, that only targeted seeding has a chance of doing that, but we're not confident that right now that that is the case. Implications? Greater attention has to be taken in cold pool diagnostic for hurricane uh, strength prediction. This is a tough one. How do we diagnose variability in cold pools in a tropical cyclone? Nobody wants to fly down there. Remote sensors aren't worth a darn in that, in down there. We're talking about a low, low 1,500, 2,000 uh, uh, feet above the surface. Uh, microwaves, uh, totally, they can't handle all that precipitation in that. So how do we map out variability in cold pools? If you can figure out how to do it, come talk to me afterwards and we'll write a proposal. A remote sensing method, and why would I said that? But I simulate and predict the aerosol impacts on tropical cyclones. The models need to have a high enough resolution in microphysics to represent convective scale dynamical responses, as well as environmental properties of cold pools. And in fact, we've done simulations with running a 10 kilometer grid space and introducing aerosols, and they get just the opposite response because we can't get the dynamical invigoration. So, in, in some sense, it could be dangerous for people to introduce aerosols in a model that can't represent the dynamical thunderstorm convective scale responses that we're, we're seeing. Could get the wrong answer. And that's all I have to say. Yes, Bill. Well. <clears throat> it seems to me that this is a half question, a major Right. <clears throat> um, we're not preaching to the choir. There are a lot of things that sign up here today with nothing to do with camp. The question is, are they convinced, are, are they, that we should begin to incorporate aerosols into operation, operation, and into research, and go beyond 
Yeah, that's a hard pill to swallow in any operational setting. You try to bring in, you know, aerosols and to that extent. And of course, that's one of the reasons I mentioned that you can't do it at 10 kilometer resolution. You're going to have to get down to one to two kilometer resolution to simulate the, the dynamic responses. And no plant conductive parameterization has that built into it, so you can't rely on that. Pete. Alex, <clears throat> is there any indication of enhanced convection in the outer rain band reaching for Hurricane Katrina? Well, you can see why I like to work with idealized simulations. At least I have a hope of understanding what's going on. There's just too many things going on here at the same time. Yes, Mark. Right. Right. No, I, I totally agree. And, and, you know, that's why I emphasize the cold pools, because the cold pools are modulated by humidity in, 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 the, in, the, in the atmospheres and the shear in the environment and a lot of other properties. Aerosols are part of that, but it's not. This is the one thing that we're kind of playing with right now, actually, and you can see the signal.
Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. We're going a little bit beyond speculation, but not a lot. Yeah. I think we better stop there. It's uh, getting lunchtime and people's stomachs are growling. I can hear them up here. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Uh, hope you enjoyed the uh, first exposure of hemp. <laughs> <laughs>